my name is Paul Rauschenbusch. I'm the Associate Dean of Religious Life at Princeton University. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to The Inner Core. This is a show where we talk about religion, spirituality, cu culture, and ethics, anything that comes to mind. Um, and today, I am extraordinarily pleased and honored to welcome to this show Professor Al Rabito, who is a professor of religion at Princeton University. He is uh, one of the finest examples of scholarship and personal reflection, personal religion. And we're hoping to today to touch on both areas of that, both the personal uh, spirituality and religious experience, and also some questions of religion in America and how religion uh, takes, uh, takes its various forms in different communities depending on their social location. So I'm very excited to, to welcome you here to this program today. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, thank you. I want to start out by just mentioning this book. Uh, I'm going to do it a couple times today because I think it's such an important book. It looks thin, but it's incredibly rich. This is called A Sorrowful Joy, and this is Professor Rabateau's personal reflection testimony, might I say, um, and, and uh, he articulates his own progression of faith, different experiences that have marked changes, transformations within his own life, within his own belief system. And it's, it's an exquisite book. If you, you can see, it's not thick. It's not a daunting book. It's meant for lay people. Can I say that? It's meant for lay people. Mm -hmm. it was not, it's not an academic book. If you're looking to have an um, opportunity for a personal reflective, uh, personal, I, you, I read this on a retreat last year, and it was one of the best things I had personally done for my own spiritual life that year. So I strongly recommend you pick up a copy of this book. It's an extraordinary read and deeply enriching. Uh, moving on, we celebrated the Princeton graduation class yesterday. Were you there? Were you able to go to I wasn't graduation? able to go to the, uh, to the actual uh, graduation ceremony, but I was at the class day ceremony for okay. those seniors who were graduating from uh, the religion department. Right, mm -hmm. right. You have had, by any standards, a spectacular career. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, I, really, it's one of these things, Princeton students, uh, I wouldn't say idolize the professors, but it's really viewed as a pinnacle to teach at Princeton, to have held, you were the dean of the graduate school. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've really had remarkable success in academics and administrative. You've taught at great universities across the country. You're a respected scholar. What piece of advice do you have about the word success? Mm. What's successful in mm -hmm. your mind? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's this, there's this golden calf almost, mm -hmm. like what, I've got to be successful. I mean, mm -hmm. five-year alumni reunion is coming and uh, I've got to have something to say, you know, right. not to mention 10 and 15. What is success to you? Um, I think success to me is basically the gratification that comes from creative work um, and work that you feel really expresses who you are and what you want to do. So for me, the most gratifying um, aspect of, of my life is teaching classes in which I can um, communicate my enthusiasm, my excitement about ideas from uh, great books that come from uh, the wisdom traditions of, uh, of people from various nations and cultures around the world. The excitement of um, exchanging ideas with uh, the students whom I teach, uh, seeing their excitement, um, reading what they write, uh, learning from them, uh, the communal process of, of education. And I take a great deal of, uh, of gratification from my own writing, uh, mm -hmm. that is from the challenge of writing. writing unlike teaching, is a very lonely craft mm. uh, and is, is therefore, I think, very difficult. Um, it's almost like sitting with uh, the pencil or the pen or perhaps the 
keyboard uh, and waiting for something to happen. Mm. And that something that happens is often very mysterious, very akin, I think, sometimes to, uh, to inspiration. Mm. And when it does happen, when uh, the idea comes and you wrestle to place it into words that express exactly what it is that, uh, that you want to say, uh, what it is, the, the meaning that you're grappling for. And when you can write that down, uh, for me there's just a tremendous sense of, uh, of creativity and of uh, purpose and meaning. Uh, when I write, I hear a rhythm, um, and um, the writing becomes for me almost like music. Mm. And if the rhythm is off, then I can tell that uh, I need to work some more at that sentence or at that paragraph. Mm. until uh, the, the rhythms uh, actually match the rhythms that I hear in my head and the, the, the meaning of the words also match that, that meaning that uh, has somehow come to me uh, mm. in that process of, of, of waiting. So on the one hand, the communal activity of, of teaching and exchanging ideas and, and the liveliness that comes about, uh, particularly in seminars, and sometimes on one-on-one -on -one uh, conversations with students and in reading their their writing, and then on the other hand, uh, my own writing, um, mm. and uh, the discipline that writing takes uh, if it is to be uh, it's to be good and is mm. to be and is to be accurate. Well, it's um, interesting that you uh, when you know I asked you about success, and mm -hmm. so the words that I'm noting are creativity, community, learning, wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, interaction, mm -hmm. um, almost a, a discipline, a rhythm. Uh, mm -hmm. You didn't mention any money, mm -hmm. and you didn't mention <laughs> status. You mentioned mm -hmm. really, I mean, things that, mm -hmm. um, that are attainable even to um, uh, us mere mortals who can't be Princeton professors, but who really have all these opportunities mm -hmm. to do all those things in our own lives. And I, and I do think that, that that's an important message for, for people to hear about what is success. Yeah, it, it goes back to uh, a long time in my life, but uh, most immediately to my own graduate career in which I, uh, I went to several different schools and um, the path uh, was was rocky at some of them and eventually I wound up at Yale uh, and then I wound up staying at Yale to teach and then I taught at, at Berkeley and I hadn't set out with a plan that I wanted to teach at uh, some of the best universities in, in the country. Um, it developed that way mm -hmm. and in some sense um, that's been a great privilege and a great blessing but it was not something that I, that I sought, and it was not something that my ego was really bound up with. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, these are places, and at those places there are people, uh, and there are other places, and mm -hmm. you know, there, are, there are people there. Mm. And um, certainly being at those universities has given me uh, a great deal of freedom. Um, I don't have as heavy a teaching load, so it makes it possible for me to write um, as uh, some colleagues at other schools where the teaching load is so heavy that it's very hard to, right. to get writing done. Uh, so I'm not gainsaying um, the privilege that I've enjoyed, mm. but I, I did not seek that privilege. Mm. And um, my ego, I hope, uh, is, is not bound up with uh, the status of being at a Princeton or a Yale or, mm -hmm. or a Berkeley. Um, for me, those were, were opportunities that that came unexpectedly even, well, and which I was able to take advantage of. And also, given your life story, mm -hmm. opportunities that you were not obvious to inherit. Yes. I, uh, reading your book um, about um, your, your father being shot by a white man before you were born, mm -hmm. some of the other extremely hurtful damaging uh, events of your life that mm -hmm. you've gone through. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel those events influenced what you who you understand to be God or mm -hmm. how you understand the Christian religion? Mm -hmm. Is that too broad of a question? Or, if, or you can reframe that, but you understand what I mean mm -hmm. because you've had mm -hmm. a, a remarkable life that no one would sign up for, mm. and yet somehow it was transformed into mm -hmm. 
um, what has turned into a beautiful thing, although not without pain. Yes. Yes. I, it, in part, um, th your question, Paul, leads me um, back to um, my family, and in particular to uh, my mother, who, because of the death of my father, as you say, he was killed three months before I was born by a white man in Mississippi, and the white man was never prosecuted. There were no witnesses to the killing, and he claimed self-defense. And my mother, at that point, um, decided that she would uh, not stay in the South. Uh, my mother was 43 when I was born, so mm. her decision was one that was uh, very disruptive for her. She had been raised, born raised in the South. All of her relatives were there. But she didn't want her three children, me and my two older sisters, mm. to be raised in the South where this could happen. Mm. And so uh, we moved uh, north to the Midwest, and life was hard. She took a job as a domestic, and um, there were many times when we didn't know where the money was going to come from. Mm. But what I saw in her and what she gave to me was um, a strong sense, sense of, of faith, of, of, of confidence and trust in God. Uh, I remember as a, as a, as a child sometimes seeing the worry on her face and trying to, trying to console her. And she would say, don't, you know, don't worry, God will provide. Mm -hmm. And so seeing uh, her faith in the midst of, uh, of very difficult times and of, of times of, uh, of great anxiety, um, I think was very much p a foundation for mm -hmm. my sense of, of God as, uh, as caring and as providing, as sustaining us in the midst of, of, of great difficulties. Uh, my stepfather came into the scene when I was four. My stepfather was a former priest, one of the early black men ordained to the priesthood in the United States. And he had, he had left uh, the priesthood um, enraged by incidents of, of racism within the Catholic Church. Um, and he too, in spite of that rage, um, was a man of, of, of deep faith and, mm. uh, and commitment to Christianity, who in spite of the scandalous behavior of of members of the church still was able to see and appreciate uh, the church as a community of faith, as the body of Christ. So from Do you a think that there is something about people who are in a situation of deprivation that makes them more inclined towards um, acknowledging God's presence. I'm just, I, I'm struck because when I was rereading your book, um, there was a, a passage from the people you were, you, uh, Souls in Motion is a, is a place that you've become very involved with, which is uh, for um, uh, people who are uh, struggling with mental uh, illness or men dif difficulties. And, and you wrote here, um, I was struck by the spirituality of the clients, meaning those who were at Souls in Motion, how frequently they spoke of God and their gratitude to God for what they had and for his bringing them this far. Mm -hmm. Now, these are people who did not just win a tennis match. They did not just win a <laughs> Grammy. You know, and yet they, they mm -hmm. I think that th this sense of um, um, appreciation for perhaps day-to-day things that sometimes we, um, those of us accustomed to privilege might forget. Yes. I think that's very true. Uh, obviously, um, you know, poverty and, and racism and oppression can also corrode one's spirit and turn, turn, one's, uh, turn the person uh, into uh, someone who's bitter and mm. angry, mm. filled with rage. Mm. But there is the opposite possibility. Um, in the Beatitudes, you know, we read, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, for they shall be filled. Mm. And there is something about, about poverty, about uh, the brokenheartedness uh, of those who suffer, that does open a space uh, for God's presence. If one is filled uh, with uh, ego, if one's filled with the drive for status, uh, if one is filled with a desire for power, if one is afraid of uh, being alone, 
um, if one is afraid of death, uh, if one tries to evade the contingency of human life uh, by all of the spurious means that we have to aggrandize the self, um, then there's no room for God to enter. Um, we're turned uh, away from uh, the light. Mm. And so we begin to shrivel up inside. So I think this question is very much related to your first one about how we mistake what success really mm. means. Yes. Um, and so the, your question relates not only to my, my own personal family, but to uh, the ancestors the ancestors in faith and uh, the little ancestor ancestors in terms of slaves, as you know, I've well, this is the twenty fifth anniversary of right. slave religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it religion or religions? Religion. Mm -hmm. Religion. Mm -hmm. Twenty fifth. It's a seminal book, uh, another seminal book, uh, which uh, which talks about slave religion mm -hmm. in America or mm -hmm. or in other places well, as well. It, it does deal with other places in terms of trying to understand what was unique about American slavery. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. distinctive about American slavery, but it's basically about America. Yes. And I suppose you would have both of these responses. There's, there's, also, there's this dip, deep religious tradition that came mm -hmm. out of mm -hmm. slave religion, but yes. then there's also a deep anger. Yes. Yes. And those don't have to be separate. No. I think, you know, anger is, mm -hmm. is a legitimate religious um, response. Yeah, uh, it, particularly when it takes uh, prophetic form. Yeah. That is a yeah. form that stands in condemnation of those things in a social order, uh, in um, uh, the realms of power that um, enslave people, that oppress people, that, uh, that mistreat people. Um, and you have a whole line of, of prophets mm. from the Hebrew Bible um, and a whole range of texts that uh, are filled with anger and rage, condemning those who oppress uh, the, the widow and the, and the orphan, yes. those who uh, grind the face of the poor, while at the same time they are offering sacrifice to God. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, uh, you also see that with Jesus in the temple, mm -hmm. don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, yes. you know, another anger, yes. angry moment. That's right. So you're right. I don't think the rage or the anger um, and uh, the sense of the presence of God uh, are antagonistic. Um, I would say that one of the things that comes out of the of my work on the religion of slaves was a deepening of my own faith. That is, at the time I was writing that book, I was struggling a great deal. This was in late 60s, early 70s, with uh, uh, Christianity and its, and its role um, in um, issues of social justice. And in writing the book, it was as if I I had uh, eyes over my over my mm -hmm. sh shoulder or voices speaking in my ear that there was a whole tradition um, within this country of uh, suffering Christianity, mm. uh, if I can use that that phrase. That is a Christianity which is in line with uh, the martyrs of uh, of the early church, um, in line with all of those who have suffered over over the centuries uh, for their faith. And on the one hand, that those voices were ones that uh, that were co quite condemnatory of uh, the sham Christianity which mm. uh, they saw around them, which justified uh, racism and, and slavery and, and oppression. On the other hand, uh, these voices spoke of a, of a faith born in that suffering, uh, which opened them up to uh, the presence of God mm. and an ability to place their suffering into the context of Christ's suffering, and therefore to find meaning in it. And you know, many people have, have noted that it's, it's the spirituals, uh, mm -hmm. the spirituals, the slave spirituals, that express perhaps the most authentic form of Christian faith um, that this country has produced. Right. When we tend to think of, of martyrdom, we tend to think of the early church, or perhaps uh, those Christians in Eastern Europe who suffered under uh, communism. Right. Um, but if we want to find uh, that tradition of suffering Christianity in our own country, I think the strongest place to find it is among the slaves mm. and um, their culture. And what about right now? I mean, for for me, when I see 
an AIDS victim mm -hmm. who's been ostracized by the church, kicked mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where I see Christ most vividly. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, and, uh, or, or uh, I mean, I think even souls in motion, people yes. who, you know, are, are just, you know, a little too off for good church, you yes. know, for good church people. Right. Um, right. And, uh, and per, you know, the, the poor um, who, who still make up a great percentage of this, this country. Now, yeah. at the same time, there, it seems like there is this, there's almost, and I've heard a couple people say it now, these, these almost two Christianities. Is mm -hmm. that, that, I know that's not mm -hmm. possible, but how do, we, mm -hmm. how do we reconcile this? You see on one hand yeah. this culture of success, so you can do this, mm -hmm. you can get rich, God wants you to be rich, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, this, and that's spreading this prosperity sure. preaching that's yeah. going on faith in faith. Africa. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. and, and I question, okay, so where does that leave suffering? Is that, is, you know, would they say that you're just, um, you're just glorifying suffering, mm -hmm. you're just uh, relishing in it mm -hmm. for some, and you don't want to help these people? Mm -hmm. is that, I mean, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know the criticism they would lay, but... Yeah, I think I think they would say that I'm I'm uh, paying too much attention to suffering, and that mm. that uh, suffering is not what God wants. That we need to concentrate on God's blessings, which mm. are that we be healthy and wealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't usually include wise in that. No, not in wise. That, it, but healthy <laughs> and wealthy. I think that's a, a deformation of Christianity. Mm. I think it's x out the cross, which is at the center of Christianity, mm. and the, at the the deep realization that it is, as we know from John's Gospel, precisely Christ raised up on the cross, who at that moment is drawing everything to himself. It's precisely at that, that moment that Christ's glorification begins. Mm. And that there is no resurrection, there is no joy, um, there is no, um, no victory without without the cross mm. that this is the fundamental paradox of christianity that in death from death comes life mm. uh, out of sorrow comes joy um, out of crucifixion comes resurrection mm -hmm. and if that is slighted um, then something of the essence is lost there's a wonderful wonderful novel that i would recommend to everyone who is watching this show um, that everyone watching the show would read, and that's James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain. Mm. In the final section of that novel called The Threshing Floor, a young man who's 14 years old, this is the, his 14th birthday, undergoes a conversion experience. Um, and it's much more than what we tend to think of as a conversion experience. Uh, while he's down there on the dusty floor of this fire-baptized temple in central Harlem, uh, John Grimes um, sees these armies of the night. These are the the offscourings of the earth. These are the wretched of the earth. These are mm. the poor. These are the beaten. These are the enslaved. These are the oppressed. And he struggles while he's there on the floor in their company, wanting to escape from their company, knowing mm. that uh, that he doesn't want this. That he doesn't want to. And there's a voice that keeps saying to him, "Get off off the floor. You don't belong here with these niggers." Mm. And um, suddenly the the vision begins to transform and. And he hear, begins to hear the voice of Paul. Twice was I, thrice was I beaten, twice was I imprisoned, uh, in shipwrecks often, in peril often. And uh, then he is struggling, and he hears the voices of the congregation around saying, "Go through, go through. You have to go through." And um, in one moment, he sees uh, a vision of the Lord. And as Baldwin puts it in this beautiful passage, suddenly the light and the darkness kissed. Mm. And he wakes um, with a very flood of tears, a fountain of tears. He wakes into the morning and he realizes that the armies of the night are the armies of light. And that he is in the company, he's been seized into the company of a people who wander on the road forever and yet find the city that's promised them forever. Mm. A road uh, where the lion threatens but whose jaws are, are stopped. Yeah. Um, a people with whom uh, you know, Moses decided to, to dwell, uh, people that, uh, out of whom Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came, and goes down through a whole litany of, of biblical figures from the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Christian scriptures. And 
what uh, what Baldwin is saying here is that um, it's through identification with those that suffer, with those who are oppressed, with the wretched of the earth, that's what it means to really be chosen. This is where God's presence is most vitally alive. Hmm. Yeah. And therefore, John's earlier temptations to uh, to escape, he's good in school, so he hopes that he might uh, escape in, you know, into Broadway, into, mm. into all the spires of New York, and escape from the squat you know, tenements of Harlem. Um, he sees as, uh, as really a temptation of the, of the serpent um, to remove him from his people yeah. and the meaning of his people's history. So in this book, Baldwin, Baldwin really um, talks about black history uh, in fictional terms from the end of slavery up to through the Great Migration and into the urban ghetto and presents the meaning of that history as black Christians have conceived it, have sung about it, have prayed about it um, for several centuries in the terms of, that they used of uh, biblical allusion, mm. of gospel hymns, of the spirituals. And this, he says, is, is the message that needs to be told on the mountain, mm. uh, the mountain here of a, uh, literally of a, of a hill in Central Park in the book, mm. but to uh, the mountain of uh, of those who think that they are in power, who think that they are in control, who think that uh, that there's no need that they have that they can't satisfy by spending money. Mm. A, a very different uh, writer, but uh, Flannery O'Connor has a book called Revelations, mm -hmm. which is about this very smug person. Thank mm -hmm. goodness I'm not white trash. Mm -hmm. Thank and goodness I'm not a nigger. Not a nigger. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, all these like, you know, oh, oh, I'm just so glad, you know. And then she has this revelation where she's actually seeing who's going. Mm -hmm into heaven mm -hmm. and it's all the people you know right. her people are going too but they're all like mystified to find themselves with right. these right. other people who are leading the way right. it's and all, her people are all singing off tune <laughs> yeah. that's right, that's right. Yes. Uh, so you yeah. know but, Bring it up but it's a uh, I think part of the you know the message here is that is is uh, that I want to mention just one more, and we're, I'm afraid we're out of time. Believe it or not, wow. uh, yeah, I could talk to you for about another 24 hours. In this book, what I want to just hit home here, especially for those of you watching this, is that spiritual life and religious expression is not something that you do once and then you're done. Right. You know, I think that's another important question. This has been a lifelong journey for you. Yeah. Uh, we didn't even get to the fact that you became an uh, Orthodox Christian, yeah. that um, you found all these different ways to keep progressing, keep finding uh, God within all these different settings. So, so that's the other message I want to leave you with is that um, this is not a one-time event. Your uh, religious and spiritual life is, is not something that you complete and then sit back satisfied. It's something that you can keep working on, that, that I need to keep working on, and even Professor Rabito uh, uh -huh. needs to keep working on. And so I leave you with that blessing that uh, keep finding God, keep finding joy, even within the sorrow of your life. And, and uh, I highly, again, recommend this book. Thank you for joining us here. And thank you so much, Professor Rabito, for this opportunity to, uh, to speak. Um, You're welcome. This is Paul Rauschenbusch, uh, Associate Dean of Religious Life at Princeton University, uh, signing off from the inner core. Thanks again for joining us.